thank you all for inviting me here. It's really nice to be visiting Sweden again. It's always fun to come to Uppsala and to talk to you about ecology and really an honor that you're flying us out from so far away to share our ideas with you. Um, today I'll be talking about um, some examples from my own recent research, but the motivating question that I want you to think about is a more general one about how we approach um, explaining systems and understanding them in ecology, whether we approach it from an extremely abstract level, an extremely detailed and specific level, or by somehow trying to combine the abstract and the specific together. And as background, I think you're all aware, oh, does this go forward? No, maybe not. This will go forward though. Aha, I think you're probably all aware that human activities have changed landscapes dramatically. Um, and that now one of the main challenges in conservation biology is how we enable populations of plant and animal species to persist in landscapes dominated by humans. Let me fix my, here we go. Does that work? Yes, okay, how we, this is, feels so strange. Um, how we enable them to persist in landscapes dominated by humans. So for example, these 21st century conservation biology questions include if you're going to have a population persist in a small fragment of natural habitat, how large does that bit of habitat have to be? Um, or maybe we want to know how do we make landscapes permeable to populations so that they can track moving windows of suitable habitat. Things Things like successionally created habitats where you need fires or floods to renew them periodically, but the fires or floods kill the organisms, so you have to track the habitat, or maybe moving windows as the climate is changing and species might need to shift their ranges to match suitable climates. Um, a third kind of question we have to ask as managers is if we have multiple small fragments of ha habitat on the landscape, how do we know if animals will move bet among them? And how can we manage landscapes to make them more permeable to movement? All of these questions are questions about spatial population ecology. And my lab group and I have worked on a number of different organisms, including all of the ones shown on this slide and many others, um, to look at these kinds of spatial management questions for populations. And one theme that's emerged in our experience working with managers is that we often want to answer questions in ways that are specific to the natural history of a particular organism. We want to know an answer for a, you know, Fender's blue butterfly or a West Coast Bombus vosnesenskii bumblebee or a pasque flower in Alberta. So we want to know answers that are specific to specific species. Um, but we want to answer them in a general way such that we can take something like a minimum patch size of habitat needed by a species and apply it to any site on the landscape. And this might partly be a uniquely American perspective because in our country we have an endangered species law that requires management agencies to set quantitative criteria for how we know when a species will be recovered and what management actions will be taken. So agencies are required to set quantitative criteria for federally listed endangered species, and yet we don't have the resources to go to every management scenario and do a specific analysis of that particular place on the landscape. So what we've been doing, my lab group and I, are trying to answer these questions about spatial population ecology in a general way that can be applied to anywhere on the landscape. And again, I want to emphasize that this might be a very different perspective than you're used to. Um, some ecologists approach questions by wanting to get the most specific answer possible as the best way to make a management decision. We're saying, no, we want to take a step back and answer things in a somewhat stylized way. Having said that it's radical, we're not the only ones doing this in ecology. Um, another thing, another field of ecology that's been doing this for a very long time is non-spatial population ecologists working with population dynamics of plant populations. Does anyone here work with plant populations? Oh, what a room. <laughs> Has anyone here ever built a matrix model? <laughs> 
Okay, we have a few. They're also used for animals. Um, but in plant ecology, this is a graph of a literature review that I was involved in, looking at the number of studies that have used this technique of demographic matrix population models to analyze population viability of plant populations. And what you can see is that now we are publishing a couple hundred of these every year of people using exactly the same theoretical framework to interpret their data and make comparable predictions. And so in plant ecology, there's been a sudden set, a, a sudden availability to do comparative ecology across hundreds of species that were all studied in the same way. So it's kind of exciting. Um, on the other hand, if any of you were a plant ecologist, well, and I guess I will add that this has been uh, enabled in part by writing of a couple books that have been very influential in translating these common theoretical frameworks to ecologists working on non-spatial population dynamics. And so maybe in spatial ecology, we should be looking for a similar shared theoretical framework. Uh, the other thing that I was going to say is if any of you were plant ecologists who worked in this, one of the things we're perhaps most known for in this field is that the predictions from these models aren't always very good outside the range of data they were collected for. So we have this great ability to do comparative analysis and to summarize data in a comparable way across studies, but we can't necessarily use this to forecast the future, even though it's something managers would like to do. So the question is, can we take these spatial ideas about minimum patch size and movement through landscapes and answer them using a general theoretical framework that will apply across species? Oh, I keep thinking this is a way to forward it, and it just isn't. Um, so the outline of the rest of my talk is that I'll talk about using these some general abstract models to guide conservation. First, I'll introduce you to conservation problems about the management of two populations of endangered butterflies, the Baltimore checkerspot butterfly and the Fender's blue butterfly. I'll then give you the theoretical context of some general models we might use to guide management. And then I'll use them to answer two management questions. And I'll talk about what we've learned, some future directions and some things for you to think about later on today. So first are two species, the Baltimore checker spot and the Fender's blue. This is the life cycle of the Baltimore checker spot. They have one generation per year. These are what the adult butterflies look like when they fly in July and August in the eastern North America. They lay eggs in clusters that look like this. The eggs hatch and there are tiny caterpillars which um, didn't fit on the slide, I suppose, that hibernate. And then in spring, they come out of diapause, and you have these big colorful caterpillars. Um, the caterpillars pupate and also have colorful pupae um, and have their generation again in the summer. They are found, this is not, throughout eastern North America. This is a range map of the world's distribution of the Baltimore checker spot butterfly, and they have rare or threatened status in five of the states in the US where they occur. Habitat patches, I keep thinking that's gonna forward it. Habitat patches for these species are defined by two host plants on which they lay their eggs. Um, like many butterflies, the Baltimore checker spot lays its eggs only on a few plant species. They eat these as early caterpillars, but then as adults, they collect nectar to fuel their flight and some of their reproduction from many plant species. Um, the two host plants for this are turtlehead, Kiloni glabra, and English plantain, Plantago lanceolata. This is their host throughout their range. English plantain is an introduced plant from Europe that many American uh, checker spot species have adopted and that is used in parts of the range. And we've done some work comparing these two host plants, although that's not what I'll talk about today. The motivating management question is that volunteers have started to become involved in restoring habitat for this butterfly. It's the state insect of Maryland in the United States. So many of our states have chosen insects. Do you guys do that here in Sweden? Do you have a state insect of Sweden? Well, national insect of Sweden? Anyway, it's the state insect in Maryland. And this is one of the states where they're worried about declines and potential extinction. Um, one of the big threats in Maryland is that there are a lot more deer than there used to be, and the deer eat the wildflowers, and so there's no host plants for the Baltimore checker spots. And so you can see this little fence here that's about three meters or five meters on a side in a square, 
and that's enclosing a patch of host plants that they've planted for this butterfly to protect it from deer. And they have to plant these tiny habitat patches because a deer can jump over a really high fence if it's got a large area in the middle to get to. So they plant these teeny tiny habitat patches um, throughout the state. Um, sometimes they're really small habitat patches. This is the University of Maryland um, in College Park near Washington, DC. And there's a student group there who has just started to plant seven little tiny habitat patches on campus. This was actually their initial plan. We've worked with them to change it a little, as you'll see in a moment. But there are large ones that are five meters by five meters and small ones that are three meters by three meters in the context of this campus that's all lawns and buildings and trees. And the question is, um, should they be, once the host plants are established, ready to carry in the butterflies and introduce them to campus? Or is this not quite enough habitat yet? Second case study, Fender's Blue Butterfly. Um, this is a female Fender's Blue. Uh, sorry, a female Fender's Blue is this beautiful teddy bear brown. A male has this blue color that gives the species its name. Um, uh, their habitat patches are defined by a single, well, actually two species of lupin plants that they lay their eggs on. Uh, mostly it's Kincaid's lupin, but they'll occasionally use a second species. Um, their life cycle, um, they're in the western part of the United States where we have mild winters and dry summers. So their growth period for, um, for caterpillar, for the caterpillars come out in about February and feed for a few months. The butterflies fly in late April through May, and then they lay eggs that hatch and also overwinter as caterpillars, um, and then they overwinter through the dry season. Um, it's a federally listed threatened species. Its entire global distribution is in the Willamette Valley of Oregon, and these green dots are sites of known populations. The main threats to this species are not only extensive human uh, development of this area, but agricultural development. In the United States, if you buy grass seed at the store, it probably came from the Willamette Valley. And possibly even here in Sweden, you can buy Pinot Noir from grapes grown in the Willamette Valley, and it's pretty good. And so the motivating conservation question here is integrating habitat features into vineyards. Um, there's been a lot of interest in some of the local vineyards and in getting involved in conservation. It's difficult to propagate and grow the host plant of the uh, Fender's Blue Butterfly because these lupins are also federally listed threatened plants and that means there's legal issues involved with propagating them and growing them on your property. Um, they turn out to be difficult to property to propagate, but it's very easy to plant these native plants that uh, butterflies use for nectar as adults. And so what some of the vineyards have become interested in doing is this kind of agri-environment scheme where they plant nectar plants for butterflies in their vineyards. And the, one of the goals of doing this is to increase the permeability of landscapes. So maybe this would enable butterflies to fly from one site to another more easily if they need to shift their distribution with climate change or just if we want to enhance connectivity among sites. So the conservation question, but what they're doing is they're adding some of the habitat features to the landscape, but not all of them. So is it good to add food for adults, but nowhere for them to lay their eggs to the landscape? Is that good or bad? In ecology, we sometimes call this would be one flavor of sink habitat, where populations might perceive resources and go there, but they wouldn't be able to persist. It would be an extreme version because there's nowhere to lay your eggs as a butterfly. Let's see if I can hit the right button. Oh, I did. Okay, so here are the two butterfly species and the motivating conservation questions. Now, what's the theoretical background we can draw on to try to answer? So the two questions are, can checker spot butterfly per populations persist in tiny patches? And will creating these uh, nectar buffer sinks in vineyards enhance connectivity so that butterflies can move through the landscape? So what brand of theory might we use to answer this? Well, there's a very long-standing body of theoretical ecology that looks at population models with movement in space and time. How many of you see, have seen a reaction diffusion equation like this before? All the professors, that's good. 
Um, so what we have is an equation that predicts changes in the number of individuals through time. Uh, that's n, and it's a function of local population dynamics, r, and of movement, d. And it's this very abstract equation that just has one parameter for local population dynamics in a particular site and one parameter for movement through particular sites. But people have solved these equations and have come up with solutions. For example, the minimum area requirements for an isolated patch. So what this is, is that if you have a circular patch of habitat on the landscape, some organism like a butterfly that's born there, the idea from this brand of theory is that one thing that limits persistence is that a population has to stay in that habitat patch long enough to reproduce enough to replace themselves so that every female butterfly has one surviving female offspring at least before it leaves. So in a smaller habitat patch, the individuals will leave faster if they don't have perfect affinity at edges and be lost into the matrix which means the rest of the world. Um, and in a larger habitat patch, they'll stay there longer before randomly encountering the edge. And so this minimum area requirement is a balance between how quickly the population grows, how quickly the butterflies reproduce, and how quickly they leave the patches based on their radius. And so you can just do some math, and you get a solution. If the minimum patch size of an isolated habitat patch, the critical radius of the circle, is equal to um, the square root of the diffusion coefficient, how fast they move, divided by population growth rate. The faster they move, the bigger the habitat patch ma must be. The slower the population dynamics, the bigger the habitat patch must be. Um, and this is, this is like magic. We can now have a simple equation that we plug numbers into to answer a sort of complicated landscape management question. Um, and you also have this constant beta 1 from a Bessel function. That's just a number that you look up in a table. Engineers use them all the time. OK, so another thing, a, a, a less famous solution to these models, are rates of invasion through heterogeneous landscapes. So theoretical ecologists have developed theoretical landscapes that aren't just circles. They're also stripes. And so you can have. An abstraction of a heterogeneous landscape where an organism is perhaps expanding its range through a landscape that's composed of habitat patches, um, which are here the open areas, um, separated by strips of matrix. So it's an invasion perpendicular to these stripes. And you might say, why is it an invasion perpendicular to stripes? And part of it is because this particular shape makes the math fairly easy because this are results from applied mathematicians. But part of it is because if you think about all the heterogeneous landscapes in the world, how do you simplify them into a scenario that you can potentially come up with rules of thumb for before you design the landscape? Well, in my opinion, as an ecologist, this is a pretty good start. In some ways, it's the worst case scenario, because the dispersing population has to keep cr crossing the boundaries. But that's a good place to start for predicting invasions. Um, and in other ways, it incorporates the fact that these butterflies are flying, moving through habitat, encountering edges, then moving through matrix, then encountering edges again. Um, and you can generalize it in pretty simple ways. So I'm comfortable with this as a starting point. Um, Shigesada in 1986 found solutions for heterogeneous landscapes for these, uh, this particular kind of model. And the solution is that in a fine-grained heterogeneous landscape where an organism in its lifetime will encounter edges many times, then population dynamics depend on the movement through this environment, depends on the average growth rate across habitat and matrix, and the harmonic mean diffusion rate. OK, that sounds a little bit complicated. But basically, you get a rate of spread of the population through the landscape that, is a fun that increases as you increase the population growth rate and increases as you increase the rate of movement. And you can take these averages if you want to. You remember harmonic means from like your high school algebra class. This is what it looks like in the equation. So this is great. We have these simple equations that we can just plug numbers we can measure into and make some predictions about population dynamics in really complicated landscapes. But the problem is that there are some differences between butterflies and abstract particles moving in space. <laughs>
And these are the ones that I think are most important. One is that butterfly ecology exists on two time scales. They're not just particles reacting and diffusing. We have movement and death of butterflies in continuous time, but we have reproduction and hibernation in essentially discrete time, where the caterpillars of these species at least don't move nearly as much as the adults. And so you can think of that whole winter thing as happening without any movement in space in discrete time, and then the adults are flying around and moving and laying eggs in continuous time. That's very different from the mathematical models that have are been analyzed in early years by theoretical ecologists where everything was happening in continuous time. The other difference that's not in the general theoretical models, although it was in my cartoons, is that organisms don't just move randomly through the landscape. They have preferences that patch boundaries. So when they encounter a boundary between habitat and matrix, they might decide to stay in the habitat. Whether that decision is conscious or not, I don't want you to worry about, but they might be evolved to stay in the habitat for different reasons. And that's not in the theoretical models. And the third thing is that this last invasion through heterogeneous landscapes, the analytical solutions are for very fine-scaled spatial heterogeneity. But of course, we might have big habitat patches on the landscape so that an organism doesn't encounter the boundary many times in its lifetime. So very recently, um, some applied mathematicians who I had never met until they wrote this paper published a paper that said, we're going to extend classical theory to include exactly these things that I thought was important for butterflies. Um, edge behavior, uh, coarse spatial heterogeneity. And some people had looked at edge behavior before this particular paper. But the two things that these guys added were the separation of time scales of different aspects of the life history and solutions for invasion rates in coarsely space heterogeneous landscapes. Um, and there's this brand of uh, set of models, I think, has a lot of promise for being a general framework for interpreting and making management predictions and understanding spatial population dynamics. So I think I'm talking more slowly than usual. So we're now going to use this theory to answer management questions. And the first question we're going to ask is about the Baltimore checker spot. How much area does a population need? What's the minimum area requirement for populations to persist in fragmented landscapes? So now we have this abstract circular patch. It's a patch of habitat surrounded by unsuitable matrix, uh, potentially with some preference at patch edges. Um, but we're going to have parameters for a real population of butterflies, the Baltimore checker spots. And for this one, I'm going to show you the math, because if you don't have edge preference, it's so easy that even I could do it. I'm not a mathematician. I'm just an ecologist. Stuff that I learned in like high school and maybe freshman calculus in university. So what you have is now a new differential equation that's predicting the change in butterflies. And I, now I have small n. I think that's kind of arbitrary. But you're, it's the continuous time part of the life cycle where they are, there's loss due to mortality, mu, and movement diffusion as a function of the patch radius. And you can solve this equation and get a relationship between the number of butterflies you have at the beginning of a season and the number of butterflies you have at the end of the season. And you get this mathematical equation that predicts it as a function of mortality, movement, um, abstracted as diffusion of particles. So butterflies are going to start as particles and get a little bit more realistic. And then the distance from the center and the patch radius. Um, the time in the patch is the reciprocal of the loss rate. So this is true for, uh, well, I'll, I'll just say this is true from calculus. Um, which means that you can say, how long will a butterfly spend in a patch with radius r? And that's 1 over the loss rate. We then assumed that these butterflies were laying eggs continuously throughout their lifespan. Um, so if that's true, then the reproduction in a particular patch which I'm calling lambda, is proportional to the occupancy time. Sorry, yeah. So the realized uh, reproduction are hat, successful reproduction per individual, um, multiplied by this occupancy time gives you the annual population growth rate. So then you can solve for the minimum patch size, which has a population growth rate greater than 1. So here's the minimum patch size now separating the two aspects of the life stage um, that gives you persistent populations. And just like in general theory, it increases uh, 
you need a bigger patch the faster an organism moves. And the higher the population growth rate is, the smaller the minimum patch size for persistence. But it's a slightly different algebraic formulation, which matters if we're going to use it to interpret data. Now, this is true. So this gives us a nice equation to use and math that even I can do, based on my one year of calculus at university, um, if there's no edge preference. So what we need to know is the annual population growth rate if habitat were not limiting, the mortality, the diffusion rate, and whether or not there's edge preference. If there's edge preference, we have to do harder math that I need to consult with applied mathematicians to know how to do. So now we go to the field and measure these particular rates. The first thing we need to know is the population growth rate. And we measure this by looking at vital rates throughout the life cycle. Um, this is Lee Brown, uh, who as a postdoc collected the data on all these different things. Um, to, you know, let's start the year of a checker spot butterfly. They come out in spring and they start eating. And so we put them in tents so that we could monitor their survival to pupation. And so um, we put them in tents with, over their host plants. We monitored their survival to pupation and could look at post diapause survival. Then we need, wanted to monitor the number of adults. So we did a capture recapture study to estimate survival and abundance of adults on the landscape. Um, here's a marked butterfly uh, painted. And here we are surveying ab every, about every two or three times a week during the summer. We revisit the same population to do these capture recapture studies. Um, we also do capture recapture studies of the nests. You might think, if you've never done field work with insects, that you could walk through a field and count all the nests in, of butterflies in the field, especially if they have these somewhat conspicuous clusters. But no, the grass is like this tall. You can't find all the nests. So about once a week, we go out and search nests during the um, September. Then we can estimate reproduction as nests per adult. We also, Lee and an undergraduate from Tufts University, developed a method for opening up the nest and counting very carefully the number of larvae before diapause. Again, you don't count it only once. You count them about three or four times. And wildlife biologists, mostly working on vertebrates, have worked out statistics for how you estimate how many there are from multiple counts. Every count is less than the total, right? But there's some theoretical distributions. Anyway. Um, so we count the number of larvae per nest, and then we built these tents to estimate overwinter survival of these uh, larvae, where they feed during September, and then they crawl down to the ground in overwinter. Once the snow comes, we remove the tents, but put markers around the base. And then when the snow melts, we put the tents back so we can get them and count how many of these uh, caterpillars that went into hibernation emerge the next year. If you put all the math together, the successful reproduction per butterfly is the product of these different vital rates. So survival over the winter multiplied by larvae per nest and nests per adult, multiplied by survival uh, post diapause. And when we did the math from our field estimates, we got an annual population growth rate of 8 in a large site. That means if you start with 2, the next year you get 16, and the next year you get whatever 8 times 16 is, like 150 or something. Is that possibly realistic? Well, it's always good to check model predictions against observations at different scales. And this is what happened to our population over the first five years of studying it. We hadn't started capture recapture studies yet in 2011, but our one concern with working at this site is that there might not be enough butterflies. The next year, we went out, and we were happy that we saw 100 butterflies there. Good, there's enough to study. The third year, there were 400. The next year, there were 1,735. And in 2015, there were about 4,300. So this is not an eight-fold increase per year, but it is a four-fold increase per year. And we're not in an infinitely large patch. So um, we've done some different corrections. Here's our estimate of the annual population growth rate from vital rates. Here's what we were seeing in the field. And we realized after we did this study that we might need to do a second correction for the fact that we were not in an infinitely large patch. And when we made that correct, I can tell you more about that later, but when we made that correction, the maximum growth rate might actually be 15 if you had a whole uh, field of host and nectar plants. Um, and those of you who study forest pests should be comfortable with this result. A lot of insects can increase dramatically in abundance over the course of a year, right? In some circumstances. So 
for our analyses, we're going to use this population growth rate of eight as kind of an intermediate one um, without this second correction and knowing that it's fairly consistent with what we saw in the field. I will also point out, as a little bit of a side trip, that this can't go on forever. Last summer, we only saw about 2,000 butterflies. You know, you can't have a population increasing fourfold forever. Um, or, yeah. So la the population is starting to decline. And when you look in the literature, it seems that checker spot populations might commonly get overcrowded and then decline due to overcrowding, although these are pretty obscure references. Journal of the Lepidopterist Society population. First, the caterpillars that came out of hibernation ate all the food. There was nowhere for those same individuals to lay their eggs as adults. They laid their eggs on milkweed, and uh, th the caterpillars all died because milkweed is not the host plant. Similarly, this is, a, th this is a good lesson for you grad students who are trying to figure out what to do with your life from, you know, what, 32 years ago um, of an experiment that didn't turn out the way they, that the author expected because the caterpillars ate all the plants in the beginning of the summer and there was nothing left for them to eat later on, but she did recognize what was going on. So as a side issue, there's some cool population dynamics that we're not going to talk about more today. Um, so that's the first half of what we need to know, the population growth rate and the mortality of adults. The other thing we need to know is habitat-specific movement. And so we do this with butterflies by physically tracking individual animals. We go out and we stand two or three meters away from them, and we watch them move through the landscape. Here are a couple students, or maybe a student and a postdoc, making a physical flight map of where a butterfly has gone. So it's, if it's flying through the landscape, then every 15 seconds when it's moving, you drop a survey flag, and you end up with a discretized flight path of where this butterfly went. Here's a field assistant watching a butterfly on a flag. And there's, uh, you then can characterize these flight paths by the distance per step, the time per step, because sometimes they sit on a plant and you can spend you know, an hour waiting for the butterfly to move again. You have to be very patient to collect these data. And the direction, um, which is quantifying how straight the flight path is. Is the butterfly turning around all the time, which obviously will keep it uh, from moving very far from where it was born over its lifespan, or is it flying in a straight line, which will make it move further throughout its lifespan? There are some famous theoretical equations for taking this correlated random walk and estimating a rate of diffusion that a particle would move at the same time. So this very abstract parameter can actually be related to these flight paths. So we did that. And we estimated that the rate of movement was 0.055 meters per second in habitat, 0.83 meters squared per second in matrix, and that they spent about four hours of time flying per day. So now we have that second parameter for the model. Third thing we needed to know was preference at patch edges. This is Al Alice Kasbrook, a very patient undergraduate student who spent a summer creating experimental turtle head habitat patches, host plant patches, and releasing butterflies at edges. Um, and just, you know, just and what she wants to know is when you release them at the edge of a host plant patch, do they fly right into the host plant patch to lay their eggs or collect nectar or do other things, or do they fly out into the hayfield? And when she released them at, right at the edge, she did 26 releases and 13 of them went into the patch. When she released them at further distances from the patch, there was absolutely no evidence for orientation towards the patch. Um, so these butterflies do not display preference at patch edges. They do. I was showing you in the last slide, but maybe didn't emphasize it. Can I do this? Oh, I did it. They do move more slowly in habitat patches. So they move much more slowly when they're in a habitat patch than when they're in the matrix. But when they get to the habitat patch, it's only the slow movement that keeps them there. It's not a preference at patch edges. And I would say that in general for butterflies, when people have looked for preference at patch edges um, of host plant patches, about half the time they find it and half the time they don't. And another thing theoretical ecologists have explored is this notion that slow movement is enough to be a good search strategy. When you encounter a resource, you move more and you turn more, and you encounter other patches of the same resource. So. Um, we now know that there's no edge behavior. We get to do the easy math, hooray. We just plug numbers for uh, reproduction, 
diffusion rate and daily survival from the capture recapture study into this model. We get a relationship between patch size in hectares and population growth rate. In the landscape, we can look, that's the orange line, we can look at where this growth rate is exactly one, which is the absolute minimum for persistence, and it happens at a patch size of about one and a half hectares. Um, and when I'm in the US saying this, not everyone knows what a hectare is, so I'm like, it's about 16 suburban lots. <laughs> um, it's not a five meter by five, it, it's not a five meter by five meter patch. So we've answered our management question. How much uh, area does a population need to persist? About one and a half hectares of native habitat. And so we have a quantitative answer we can apply to a landscape. Um, what the people at the University of Maryland are doing is working with surround, adding a little bit more on campus, but also working with surrounding landowners to encourage planting of native plants and butterfly host plants in their yard before they start introducing anything to campus. So we have this general theory that's given us a quantitative answer. Okay. The second motivating question is sink habitat better than matrix. So here we have this invasion through these stripy landscapes and these are characterized by just two parameters, the width of the habitat strips and the width of the matrix strips. Um, and sometimes we talk about the spatial period as the sum of these two widths. So the data I'm going to use to answer this question for Fender's blue butterflies come from field studies of movement that my collaborator Cheryl Schultz and I, well, mostly Cheryl Schultz, but with some work from me, did back in the 1990s, some of them. And we have the butterflies, again, moving through landscapes. We use the same techniques of demography and tracking flight paths. And what we get are parameters where these little blue butterflies actually move a lot faster than the checker spots, but there's the same qualitative result that they move more slowly when they're in habitat patches and more quickly in the matrix. And in Oregon, they seem to fly about two and a half hours per day. Their daily survival is 0 0.93, and the maximum growth rate for this species is a little bit lower, but still high. If habitat were not limiting, they could increase about two and a quarter fold per year. When you do releases at patch edges, these have distinctly non-random behavior, about 95% of them stay in the habitat patch or go into the habitat patch from the edge, and only about 5% leave. So here we have to do the hard math. Good thing that Musgrave and Lucher did it for us. Okay, we have these complicated equations for invasion through heterogeneous landscapes, but it's still just algebra, and it's still the parameters we can measure. Habitat-specific diffusion, mortality, growth rate, edge preference, and strip width. Uh, you do it by having some dispersion relation and minimizing it to get the rate of invasion through the landscape. And just like in general theory, although the equation's more complicated, the rate of invasion increases with faster population growth rates and increases with faster diffusion coefficients. So if we look at the parameters for this species in habitat patches and in the matrix, in habitat patches, they move more slowly. They have high population growth rates. And um, here's the survival on a per second basis uh, to compare to the diffusion. Here in the matrix, they have much faster movement. They have zero population growth rate. This is a matrix now with no nectar plants either to start with. Um, and they have uh, a higher rate of mortality. So they don't survive as much when they have no nectar plants to eat. And they have preference at patch edges. Here is what happens in the invasion for a one kilometer period um, through habitat and matrix. What you see is initially there's some minimum amount of habitat you need for the population to persist. Then as you add more habitat, invasion speed increases to a point. But if you have a lot of habitat, a surprising thing happens, um, which is that the rate of invasion through the landscape goes down because the benefit of faster speed um, in the landscape in the matrix is sometimes greater than the cost of not reproducing there. If your goal is to have animals move through the landscape, a mixture of habitat and non-habitat is better than 100% high quality habitat because most animals move faster in non-habitat. Okay, I have to remember not to touch that. What happens if we plant nectar plants? Well now, it turns out from preliminary studies that Cheryl and some of her grad students have done, although these are unpublished and should be taken with a grain of salt, that when you plant all these nectar plants but no host plants, they go back to slow movement, 
uh, they still don't have any population growth rate, they have higher survival, and they lose their edge preference. So what happens if you want uh, movement through a landscape with nectar plants? Um, here's the rate of movement as a function of the percent habitat if you have uh, host plants and nectar plants only in the landscape as opposed to host plants and matrix. And when you have these nectar plants, the benefits of increased survival are never greater than the costs of reduced speed and reduced edge preference. So, is sink habitat good to add to agricultural landscapes? Not if your goal is to have populations be able to move from one area to another. It does increase the population growth rates of organisms in habitat patches, potentially surrounded by nectar plants, and I'm not going to tell the wineries not to plant native plants in their vineyards, but it's not going to help organisms track climate change because the costs of moving slowly but still not reproducing are greater than the advantage of moving quickly through the matrix. So, what have we learned by looking at these two case studies? Well, one thing that is surprising to many ecologists until you do the math is that animals don't always stay in their habitat patch. Okay, that's not surprising. But what that means is that the minimum area requirements can be set just by the balance of movement versus reproduction. Another thing we've learned is that many animals move faster in lower quality habitat. And what this means for the specific case of this nectar buffer agri-environment scheme is that this might not help populations even though they're using it if your goal is range expansion. Another implication is that heterogeneous landscapes are easier to invade than landscapes of 100% high quality habitat, at least under some conditions. Uh, um, the other thing that I think is important to realize is that you need the data and the theoretical framework to quantify these trade-offs. So just by measuring the parameters, I wouldn't have known whether uh, exactly where the trade-off between ha adding more habitat or having faster invasion is. Um, and I think that these circles and stripes are a reasonable place to start for landscape planning. Um, I think I'm almost out of time, aren't I? So one thing, another thing that I like about this general theoretical framework is that you can potentially use it for comparative ecology. So really quickly, we also said, well, does the matrix matter? How does movement vary through landscapes with habitat and fields versus habitat and forests for both species? What we need to know is all these uh, movement rates through the forest. Both of these are meadow butterflies that use host plants that only grow in meadows. So we release them at patch edges, and we see now that Baltimore checker spots, although they don't have preference for host plants, they do have preference at patch edges. And they have intermediate diffusion rates through forests. So if we compare them, they can't reproduce in hay fields or in forests. They have the fastest movement through hay fields, but they have preference at patch edges in landscapes of hay fields and forests. Here's a graph for Baltimore checker spot of invasion speed through landscapes composed of habitat and matrix. Here's what happens if it were habitat and forest. And what you see is that at very low amounts of habitat, it's better if the matrix is forest because the advantage of staying in the habitat patch and not leaving is greater than the advantage of faster speed through the hay fields. Um, and I guess the other thing I'll point out is that, well, percent habitat of one or two percent, that's totally realistic for a butterfly that only lays its eggs on one host plant. Okay, uh, same thing for Fender's blue butterfly, same model, same question, different biology. So Fender's blue butterfly also already has this really strong edge behavior, and when we released them at the uh, lupin patches that were adjacent to a forest, that didn't change their preference. They, for them, it's all about their host plant. So we have a similar pattern of movement, fastest movement in hay fields, intermediate in forests, slowest in host plants. Um, I think there was a typo on the vital rates, but anyway. Um, so here, it's always a faster rate of invasion through hay fields and habitat as opposed to forests and habitat. Because here, there's no advantage to having the edge behavior of, in the forests, only the cost of slower movement. And what I think is cool about that, oh, sorry, let me just, what I think is cool about that is that we're getting very different answers for the management question, but we've done them using exactly the same theoretical framework so we know where this difference is coming from. Okay, so 
what else am I thinking about doing to, uh, if we want to use this as a general model? Well, there's some other aspects of the theory that need to be completed for landscapes composed of circles and stripes. Um, the other thing that, of course, we're doing is we're comparing predictions from these abstract landscapes to both simulations of populations on real landscapes and management outcomes. And I just want to show you, we've been doing this with the Fenders Blue for 25 years or so now. This is a map of its global distribution, and the size of the circles is proportional to the number of butterflies. Um, this was what it looked like when we started. This is what it looks like now. These are some time series of abundance of butterflies at different sites. And what you can see is that the population is recovering. There's a lot more butterflies now than there used to be. There's a lot more sites than there used to be. And we're getting close to the point of being able to um, change it from an endangered species to a threatened species and then potentially delist it later on. And that's really exciting. So, I mean, it's exciting because we've been able to give managers answers that were helpful to them. And because, of course, this isn't an experiment, but at least it seems to be working. <laughs> um, anyway, and then the last thing is that, of course, there's other kinds of movement. There's animals that have movement around a den or a nest. There's animals that have directed movement like migration. And before I could hand these models to a, a random empirical ecologist, we need to finish this theory also. So this is now essentially the end of my talk. As we step back a little, I just wanted to say, you know, so the thing I want you to think about is, is it useful to have these very abstract general theories that are clearly not right, but are a framework for everyone to interpret their data? It gives us a common basis for conversation, and potentially in 20 years, we'll have hundreds of comparative uh, movement studies. We already have the data. People are tracking all kinds of animals with different technology, but we're all interpreting it in idiosyncratic ways. Um, on the other hand, it kind of constrains us to taking these models literally when maybe they're not meant to be that way. Um, I do think that as we step back, um, thinking about integrating uh, you know, the complexity of real landscapes with some general ideas from theory will help us both improve, have new ideas in terms of theory, and also improve the way we apply conservation. And so, I just want to thank all of you for listening. You've seen this slide like four times now. Um, <laughs> but that's good, because these people did a lot of important stuff. Um, both Cheryl Schultz and Lee Brown, without whom I wouldn't have the data, and Gabrielle Maciel and Fritjof Lucher, the applied mathematicians who, even though their paper was almost perfect, had to tweak some of the results um, in order to make them usable by ecologists, and many other people who've helped. Thank you. <laughs>